Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before I introduce the secretary, I want to thank each of you for joining us today. As a reminder, when I call on you during the Q&A portion, please walk to the microphone to ask your questions. Today, we are also happy to have several members of the media participating remotely. While we won't have the ability to hear you just yet, we will have the ability to receive your questions. Please send in your questions via the link provided, and a member of our team will relay those questions to the secretary verbatim. Since we have several folks joining us today and lots to share, I turn the floor over to Secretary McDonough. Thanks, Terrence. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see some familiar faces uh, and some masks, though not all the masks. Uh, welcome to the reporters joining us online as well. A first, as Terrence has just said, for one of these press conferences and to the VA employees watching online. Thank you all for joining us today. To start, I just want to mention that for the very first time, we are presumptively paying toxic exposure claims to Gulf War veterans, specifically to those who suffer from asthma, sinusitis, and rhinitis as a result of their service. We've already processed more than 3,800 claims, delivering millions of dollars in benefits that vets so rightly deserve. We're not going to wait for Congress to act on this. We're acting ourselves, and we'll have more news on that front soon. For now, these new claims, along with the Blue Water Navy claims and new Agent Orange claims, Agent Orange claims resulting from the National Defense Authorization Act last year have led to a surge in the claims backlog, which will grow again later this month, in fact, this coming weekend. To proactively address this surge in the backlog, we're hiring and training 2,000 new claims processors. We're using American Rescue Plan funding to pay overtime for processors, and we're deploying FY22 budget resources to expedite toxic exposure claims processing by digitizing records and by making sure that we have appropriate funding for uh, comp and pen exams. We're processing claims at a record pace, and given these additional steps, we fully expect to reach our goal of reducing the claims backlog to 100,000 claims by 2024. Another top focus this month, since we last got together, and frankly every month, is ending veterans' homelessness. Two weeks ago, I visited Veterans Row in Los Angeles. It's an encampment of homeless veterans just outside the West LA Veterans Affairs Medical Center, FAMC. And about 40 homeless vets were living there at that time during my visit. And we are working closely with partners like the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, the LA County Sheriff, host team, PATH, Volunteers of America, Salvation Army, Step Up, and US Vets to get these veterans into housing. While I was walking through the camp that afternoon, I met a veteran who needed housing and needed help. That was Wednesday afternoon. That night, our partners got him into a hotel. And by 10 a.m. Thursday, the next morning, he was in a housing complex at the West LA VA complex, the same complex I was visiting that day, receiving what every homeless vet receives in our care, help for the issues that led them to be homeless in the first instance. That includes helping them find a job, legal assistance to navigate the justice system, care for sub substance use disorder, mental health care, and more. In LA, there are between, we assess, three and 4,000 more vets just like him. And across the country, there are about 40,000 more vets. In LA, we are building a by-name census of those homeless vets. We're learning their stories and we'll get them the help they need, just like we're doing for the veteran I met on Vets Row. 
So today we want to announce two very concrete steps we're taking to address veterans homelessness in Los Angeles. First, we're going to get the vets currently living on Veterans Row into housing by November. Second, we're going to get an additional 500 homeless vets in Los Angeles into, ho into housing by the end of this year, making sure they're home for the holidays. Of course, our efforts are continuing all across the country, but there are more homeless vets in LA than anywhere in America. So as we solve the problem there, we give momentum to our efforts across the country. Next, I wanna quickly update you on something we've discussed at length in this room as a group, and that's our employee vaccination effort. As you know, VA was the first department in the federal government to implement a vaccine requirement for our employees. That requirement applies across our enterprise, but we're focused intently on the first manifestation of that, which is on all VHA healthcare employees. And the deadline to meet it was October 8th. Thus far, we've collected vaccination data for about 70% of our VHA employees and we're digging into that data now. We've also begun the disciplinary process for the, for the requirement, the first step of which is counseling. Counseling will help us drive to our, toward our ultimate goal of getting every employee vaccinated and help us collect the remaining 30% of records so we can make further determinations from there. And remember, we're doing this to keep veterans safe. Anytime any vet walks into any VA facility or anytime any VA employee appears at a veteran's home, that veteran needs to know that we have done everything in our power to keep them safe. We're off to a good start and we'll have updated numbers for you as they come in. On a separate note, we've already administered more than 228,000 third shots or booster shots to veterans. And we're reaching out directly to vets, their families, caregivers, to make sure they are informed and encouraged to get another shot as soon as it's available to them. Lastly, I want to just take a moment to recognize one of our great VA nurses. Her name is Sherry King, and she's been working at the VA Medical Center in Lexington, Kentucky for 42 years. Her dad was actually a resident engineer at VA when she's growing up, so she says that she's not an Army brat or a Navy brat. She says she's a VA brat. And throughout this pandemic, she's done incredible work. She's helped create and execute our vaccination processes in Lexington, and personally overseen the vaccination of thousands of vets VA colleagues, families, and caregivers, all while excelling at her day job. She's had to work nights, weekends, even early mornings, but she hasn't minded, she says, because she's so proud of the work we're doing and proud to still be working at VA 42 years later. Sherry also said, as everybody at VA seems to say, that if I was going to mention her name, then I need to mention all of the great people she works with because none of the work would have been possible without them. So Sherry and Sherry's teammates, if you're watching, I'm honored to work with you. I wanted to close with your story, not only be to honor you, but because as Sherry reminded me, reminded me your work is emblematic of the way so many VA employees have responded to the pandemic. Worked long hours, risked their own lives to save veterans, stepped up when the country needed them most. For that, our country owes them a real debt of gratitude and so surely do I. That's all I got for you today for the prepared remarks. Let's get into the questions. Thanks a lot, everybody. Adam. Does Adam get to go first every time? <laughs> Everyone needs, needs to have a beat, beat so, so I guess, guess that's, that's mine. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so you'd mentioned that the 
homeless outreach will begin in LA because LA has the highest population of homeless veterans in America. Uh, is there a plan to potentially prioritize or focus on areas outside of LA that have a high population of homeless veterans? And which regions or metro areas are these? Yeah, thanks very much. So uh, let, me, let me just say it's not to, that it will begin. It's actually been ongoing. Um, we are expressly laying out these two targets today uh, to assume what I think is the appropriate role for VA, is, which is a leadership role uh, for our veterans specifically. Um, one. Two is uh, there are a range of uh, cities uh, and communities across the country where we're very aggressively uh, active, including right here in Washington, D.C. Um, in fact, it was just yesterday that I signed out uh, the awards of grants under our SSVF um, program, which is basically a uh, significant amount of funding from Congress to allow us to provide support service to veterans and families when they find themselves um, homeless. In fact, that's one of the particular innovations of VA programming on homelessness, which is that we, as I said in my remarks, treat uh, not just the question of getting in a home, but actually addressing the range of challenges that vets uh, confront because of and led them to homelessness in the first instance. So I'd be happy to get you a breakdown of our sense of where the vets are uh, generally, and I'm sure others would be interested in that. Um, but I will tell you that I attach particular importance to the situation in LA for the reason I said. One, it's a hard, larger concentration of veterans than anywhere else in the country. Two, it's LA. So it generates an additional amount of attention. So as we succeed, that will uh, infuse a sense of momentum across the country on this. And it is that momentum that led us to uh, reduce by half the homeless population between 2010 uh, and about uh, 2016. Here. Lisa. Hi, Secretary. Um, so, hey, Lisa. hi. So, can you tell us? You have data on seventy percent of yes. VHA employees who are vaccinated. Correct. Okay. What does the data tell you? <laughs> How many are vaccinated? Yeah. So we we're obviously digging into that now. Um, we have been. I've been briefing you off different types of data that we've had now for a couple months. Some of it was self attestation. We now, consistent with uh, our established policy and the president's guidance, have a process whereby employees actually upload in a way that protects their privacy, fact of and confirmation of the vaccination. And so we're just digging into that now. I don't have a lot of specifics to brief you out on that. That's why I've uh, just wanted to give you the top line and then commit to you that as we get in under the hood there and see what we're seeing, um, that I'll make sure that we're talking to you about it and getting you the information you need on it. Okay, so how, can you estimate how many people are, as you said, you're starting the disciplinary, the counseling process, how, how many people are receiving counseling? Uh, well, uh, let's just break down the numbers for a sec. So you, you, we have, we've been talking a lot about denominators around here, so let me give you two denominators. Overall, for purposes of, the, now this is a dynamic number, so it changes every day um, because it's a big organization. But we have roughly 420,000 employees in VA, okay? In VHA, which is the lion's share of our employees, we have 380,000, okay? Now, we've briefed these numbers at different, different numbers at different times, and so, uh, you know, we, we talked at length now a couple months ago with you guys about this. Um, but those numbers are our most up-to-date numbers uh, as of today. 380,000 in VHA, 420,000 um, in the entire enterprise. How many will be in counseling? I just don't have that number yet, but I know 30% of that top line number are gonna be getting a visit to make sure that they get their data into the system mm -hmm. that our employees were required to do that 
right? They're required to do it. And if they choose not to do it, and after we get through our disciplinary process, continue to not do it, they'll be fired. Right. But wait a sec. So are you, I mean, so 30% of the VHA employees haven't yet, I mean, the deadline was October 8th, so it's only been a week-ish. Right. They haven't uploaded the data yet. I mean, do you, are, does that lead you to conclude that those people are not vaccinated? It doesn't. It, no. It doesn't. This is why, this is why I just, this is okay. why I wanted to, and I'm glad you're asking the question. This is why I want to kind of, uh, well, so for example, right now, there's two ways you can upload your data. I've just up uploaded mine and I, I have the, the cool printout that you get. I'm pretty psyched about that. Um, you can also submit a paper form. So we have on supervisors desks around the country paper forms. Is that the difference between 70 and 100%? I don't know, to be honest with you. But that's why uh, I'm telling you we're digging into that now. And remember that the disciplinary process will be exercised by supervisors in individual VA facilities. So that's why I also don't really have yet mm -hmm. that specific number of how many people will be counseled. But again, those people who, for whom we do not have record yet will be counseled in the first instance to get their data because this is about getting vaccine into arms. Okay. And it's about veteran patient safety. Okay. Last thing, and I'll let sure. someone else go. Do you, I mean, do you think that, you know, eventually, maybe hope, hopefully soon in the next week, couple of weeks, you will actually will, I mean, I know it's a very decentralized yes. system. Obviously, we all know that. Do you think that the data will actually be knowable? Yes. About, okay. I do. I do. And I actually had hoped I could come brief you guys about it today. Okay. Um, uh, but it's just, it's incomplete. I, I, have an ins I have an incomplete handle on it. It itself is incomplete. Uh, and my commitment to you guys is the same as it was before, which is, uh, I'm going to show you the data and, you know, let you guys come to the conclusions you will. Okay. Thanks. Okay? Yep. Leo. Thanks for doing this, Mr. Secretary. Just to follow up on, on that, if folks are going through counseling now, what is, what is the timeline for when they might face additional action? Because you've said all along the, the impetus for this is to make sure that veterans know that exactly. this is a safe place. So if counseling is going to take a few weeks and then a few more weeks, how, how should veterans be confident that, that folks are vaccinated and that it's a safe space? Yeah. Um, the, the process starts with counseling, and if we get to it, ends with separation. There's a lot of steps along the way, Leo, and we think both because of the size of the system, i.e., uh, as Lisa said, it's decentralized, big system. Um, we anticipate just the execution, for example, of something like the counseling will take, uh, I, I, I ballpark, basically a week or two. So if we have a series of steps in our disciplinary process, which we call is progressive, as it gets progressively more onerous, the longer a veteran chooses not, even as we're answering their question, uh, sorry, a, an employee chooses not, even as we're answering their questions uh, to get vaccinated, it could take over the life of that uh, disciplinary process as long as two to three months. It needn't take that long, but it could take that long. So my commitment to the veterans is to execute this transparently. Uh, and it's the same commitment I've made to the employees, which is this will be executed transparently in a fact-based way, individualized to each employee's particular situation, um, but always with veteran safety at the heart of the determination. Okay. And with, with the booster shots, do yes. you have any sense, I know we've we talked in the past about some of the vaccine hesitancy among some groups yes. and everything. Do you, do you have any sense of how that's going? Obviously, the boosters are dependent on when folks got it and 
uh, you know, their, the, the appropriate amount of time. But are you, are you getting any reports of folks who, who are reluctant to get it or who are just saying, I got enough, I don't need to, I don't need to worry about the third shot? But it's a fair question, and, and I, it's a logical one for you to have asked, and I should have prepped myself better. I don't have any, anything useful, especially since I highlighted in there that not only have we already administered 330,000 about, but we're actively going out to get our vets. Um, so uh, let me get you more information on that. I don't, um, it hasn't come back in any of our kind of periodic updates on the execution of this. We get a, you know, uh, Donald and I get a, a uh, get a twice weekly update on how we're doing on uh, vaccination. So uh, it hasn't come up there, but that's not material really. Uh, I'll find out for sure if we're, if we're seeing any particular manifestations of um, hesitancy. All right, great, thank you. Okay, great, thanks. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. You mentioned that there's 3,800 claims for the new burn pit presumptives. Yes. Um, can you tell me if those were new claims filed or whether they were the result of going back and looking at old claims um, or claims that were you know, currently being um, examined anyway? Um, and yeah. also, can you tell me whether we could expect some more burn pit presumptive conditions announced in the coming months? Um, one, I believe those are 3,800 new claims, but I'll verify that. I believe those are 3,800 new claims. Um, one, two, uh, if I remember the data right, uh, we're on a grant rate of about 62% there. I know that's meaningful to you, so um, that's the second piece of data I can share on that. On the, the third question on any new presumptives, I don't have any announcements on that, except to remind you that um, my view and the process that we have set up here since uh, the new team arrived is to have quarterly updates at the VA Executive Board, the VAEB, where we are getting updates on what the science is telling us and what decisions we can make off that science. Uh, so we have a meeting coming up, I think, uh, either ne uh, the week after next, I think. Uh, so that will be our next update, our ne next chance to hear where we are in that, and hopefully we'll be in a position to give you some news then. And is that the same board that may be considering hypertension and that other, um, there's another presumptive out there for Agent Orange related conditions? Uh, yeah, well, so so the board itself is actually our, gov our, our kind of our flagship governance uh, um, structure in VA. So all big policy decisions that need to be considered across the enterprise are considered in the VAEB. We do have a um, uh, toxic exposure center of excellence that is staffed and that is now uh, fixed into the interagency policy-making process that allows them to get additional science from DOD, from the Department of Labor, from HHS, from the firefighters, from NIH. Uh, so yes, that group is constantly considering uh, uh, toxic exposure and impact on conditions to include, um, I think you're asking about hypertension, Agent Orange. Uh, so yes, that they are also considering that. Last thing I'll say is we're also in touch with Congress. I've had extensive conversations with them. We've sent up extent, extensive, in fact, enhanced techno, technical um, assistance on their bills. And I think one or both of those bills that are currently pending uh, in the House and the Senate, uh, I think both presume uh, to connect hypertension to Agent Orange. Can you also explain why um, you said that the claims backlog is going to jump this yep. coming weekend? Yeah, the reason it's going to jump this coming weekend is we're going to uh, spill into the 125-day, uh, over the 125-day window uh, for those uh, claims filed consistent with um, the, the NDAA, Agent Orange Presumptives. It's bladder cancer, hypothyroidism, and um, Parkinsonism. Um, we did not require veterans who had already filed 
for those conditions in the past to refile. We said, uh, we applied what's called the Niemer standard, and so we went ahead and just said, we'll go back, find your claim, and re-adjudicate it. Those claims will now trip into the 125-day backlog window this weekend. I forget if it's Saturday or Sunday. So we'll go, right now we're about 200,000 claims. This weekend we'll go up to 260,000 claims. So I'll just give you a quick run. When we got here, we were about 216,000 claims. We worked that down to 180,000 claims. About a, a month and a half ago, that jumped up to 220,000 claims with the Blue Water Navy claims. That's now been worked down to just over 200,000, 200, and it will jump up again this weekend to 260,000. Thank you, appreciate it. Yep. Uh, thank you for doing this. Um, you've said in the past that you, the last thing that you want is to have to fire yes. uh, trained staff. Do you have yes. contingency plans in place if there is some sort of mass separation or voluntary separation? Yeah, we're looking really hard at it. Uh, we're like looking really hard at it. We don't, we're obviously, as I've said, we're just aggregating the data we have now, but we had been looking at um, the attestation data that I've been briefing you all on uh, here to four, looking at that, trying to get a sense as best we can on where uh, people might be and what the nature of their employment might be to try to make sure we're in a position to do that. But we're also, uh, we've also been kind of exercising this capability, this emergency kind of, uh, whether it be dams, uh, you know, disaster emergency, uh, disaster assistance, emergency medical personnel, um, or um, other authorities to kind of move VA personnel among uh, regions uh, that need it. So I don't have any news for you on it, but we are look. Our planners are actively looking at that. And I wanted to ask about um, if you have any data on exemption requests that have come in. And um, I know that the guidance, at least on the government-wide level, has said to weigh not just the, the basis for the request, but also the nature of the person's job. So how do you, um, how have you directed frontline supervisors to, to weigh that as they're yeah. making those decisions? It's an, it's an excellent question. So uh, as with all the data, I think the data on um, exemptions is incomplete. But I can tell you that it's uh, a bigger number, uh, at least so far, as near as I can tell, than, uh, for example, we experienced, as I've been talking to you guys about, with the religious uh, exceptions sought from the flu vaccine mandate a year ago. Uh, how much more is not yet clear? So the answer is, to your first question, do we have data on exemptions, uh, exceptions? We're getting that data, it's incomplete, but it does look to be more than it was uh, to the flu vaccine. Uh, on your second question, we won't look behind under or overall question the legitimacy of any individual employee's religious exception. Okay, so that's point one. We're not asking our employees to do that. We don't intend to do that. But we are the country's largest integrated healthcare system. And the, you know, we serve veterans uh, in VHA, obviously, and NCA. And we have a responsibility, as I've said from the beginning, to, gear, to protect the health of the veterans uh, who come to us for their care. So I believe that in certain, certain circumstances, an unvaccinated employee poses a serious risk to the health of our veterans. Uh, again, that could be a health setting or it could be a benefit setting. And so we couldn't allow an unvaccinated patient, uh, employee to function in that or work in that setting. So we will, of course, try to accommodate the religious exception uh, for an employee who has sought the religious exemption exception from being vaccinated. But if we're not able to operate certain healthcare capabilities or provide certain services uh, 
for example, if too many employees claim an exemption, this would present an undue hardship to us and ultimately to the veteran. So in that case, I would be faced, when we're faced with an undue hardship uh, by a lack of a vaccinated employee, my uh, intention is to deny that employee again in an incident of undue hardship, deny the, that employee the religious exception. And if uh, once we have all the necessary data, we've worked through the process I just briefly saw about, and at the end of that process, the employee still refuses to get vaccinated, they'll be separated. Bye. Thank you. And you can't see, but I think uh, Jennifer, I, th I think it's Jennifer in the back too. Okay. Oh. Hi, I'm Kelly. Um, I'm curious if you're seeing an uptick in use of VA by veterans after the, the end of the war in Afghanistan, and if you expect to see an influx of claims because of that as well. It's a good question. I don't have anything, uh, it's a great question on the claims. I don't have anything uh, interesting for you on that, uh, but let me let us take that one and come back to you on it. On uh, what we're seeing in terms of uh, reaction or request for care, um, I think I'd say a couple things. Um, I raise this now when I'm on the road, uh, and I was just in Albany, New York this week, and the answer in Albany, New York uh, was yes, they're seeing an increase uh, in request for uh, mental health services connected uh, to uh, Afghanistan. Interestingly, say, irrespective of era of the veteran. Hmm. And in fact, they, this is all anecdotal, but they said that there is in fact an intensification of concern among Vietnam era vets for fear that, um, as it was represented to me, that um, some of these Afghan vets will go through what they, the Vietnam vets, went through. Uh, that's anecdotal. Hmm. Across the system, we don't see a substantial uptick in requests. You know, one data source is uh, calls to the veteran crisis line. We saw in, in, the, in the immediate uh, kind of aftermath of the intensification of violence in, in uh, um, retrograde, uh, we saw an increase of about 7% in calls to the veteran crisis line. We, we uh, so that's uh, meaningful, but not uh, what we would consider substantial increase. We, for, it, for us to consider it a substantial increase, we generally consider that when it's 20% over year to date prior, All right? Um, interestingly though, the nature of the calls was different. Intensification of texting and chat um, which is starting from a much lower base, much less intensification of calls, hmm. per se. So that may be meaningful uh, in as much as younger vets are much more likely to use text or to use the chat function. Um, the last point, and this uh, is also anecdotal, and we'll see if there's, new, uh, if there's new data on this. I haven't asked for data in about a week, but we'll, get, we'll find if there is and we'll get to you. Uh, what we did see, what, what I have heard in my travels and in my consultations with the field um, is an intensification of need for care among those already in our care. You see what I mean? So there, it, it could be manifest in a lot of different ways of one, uh, you know, more vets seeking services. We're seeing that anecdotally, but not across the system. But uh, we're also seeing anecdotally a request for more profound or uh, more services among vets currently in our care. So we'll see if there's data on that for you too. I hope that's responsive, that's, a, that's the best I got. I know it's anecdotal, but I don't, I don't have anything more than that at the moment. No, that's great, thank you. Okay, great. Jim. It seemed like you had her on ice, she had her hand up for a while there, and you, what were you doing? Hi, thanks. Hi. Um, on a different topic, obviously, um, you guys have a statutory requirement as it pertains to the Mission Act yes. and the access standards. Yes. And there have been some changes in the community care office that, that you guys, um, I think, I believe, have announced. So I'm just curious, do you see um, 
your, the administration's position and your stance under your leadership toward the Mission Act, um, again, within the framework of the, of the yeah. legal requirements, to be similar to that of the previous administration, or do you feel like you have a different relationship to how you guide veterans in terms of where to get care, or your kind of philosophical view about, about that law? It's a great question. So um, I, I think, uh, let me start with just making sure that people understand the first issue you raise, which is this idea that we've uh, we made a change. I think what you're referring to there, Jennifer, if I'm not mistaken, is the, our announcement um, week before last to establish an office of integrated veteran care, IVC, and that's a, a an effort that will kind of carry out over the course of kind of three phases, um, which is what we're going to do is basically. Um, establish an office where one office, the Office of Integrated Veteran Care, where a vet can come get access, whether that vet is getting care in the community or whether that vet is getting uh, care in the system. There's two offices right now. One is called the Office of Community Care. The other is called the Office of Veterans Access to Care. A year ago, um, VHA began a review to say, hey, is this the best way to serve our veterans that they have to kind of choose a door to walk through to get their care? When VHA's and my view, I was not here at the time, but surely my view, and I think the view of the statute is the veteran should get the care where the outcome for the veteran is best. So sometimes it's, you know, there's, it doesn't make any sense and as I looked at it and I think as VHA looked at it to have two separate offices, redundant overhead, uh, redundant infrastructure where a vet uh, has to kind of choose which door does he enter. So the, what we announced uh, about two weeks ago is actually uh, an intensification of the effort uh, consistent with the Mission Act that uh, says the vet should get the care uh, where the vet is going to get the best outcome. Right Now, the Mission Act has other requirements. If the wait for access to care is too long, more than 20 days, for example, for primary care, more than 28 days for specialty care, they should be uh, referred into the community where they could presumably get access to primary care or specialty care quicker. So we obviously uh, follow that very closely. We uh, live up to that uh, very closely. We are briefing Congress consistently, regularly on that. And we take uh, our legal obligations there very seriously. Um, last point. Uh, so I hope that's helpful uh, so far, but let me get to the last point, which is you asked kind of a philosophical question. Or sorry, one, one last fact question. As we briefed last month when uh, Dr. Upton came in, um, we're actually spending right now for care in the community at some significant increment over the levels planned in the, the then FY21 budget, which, you know, you guys are all budget nerds. You understand that the FY21 budget was submitted by the last team, not by us. So in fact, we're spending at a rate higher than the last team budgeted for and planned for. In fact, we've had to go to Congress to ask for two um, transfers to allow us to cover that care, in the, that, the cost of that care in the community. So. I don't know if that's, that, that's just a fact, that's not a manifestation of philosophy or otherwise, but that, that's just a fact. I think it's a meaningful fact as we talk about um, and as you know, people uh, consider whether A, we're following the law, and B, are we somehow reducing access to the, care, to the community in some way. Now, lastly, to your uh, philosophical question. I have said that I'll make all my decisions here in this job, and in fact, testified to this under oath, that I would do it uh, based on two fundamental questions. Is it 
increasing access for veterans and is it improving outcomes for veterans. I happen to believe, and I've said this now in public testimony and otherwise, and in this room a lot, that veterans in our care, as it relates to outcomes, actually do better. And I'm proud of that fact, and I think our clinicians are really proud of that fact. And so uh, I really want to make sure that we're making an argument to and uh, veterans that we want to keep them in our care, that we're demonstrating not only that we want to keep them in our care, but we're meeting the timelines that they need. We're beating the statutory timelines. Uh, and so that we express not only but in word, but in deed, that we want to keep vets in our care because I think that's, at the end of the day, better for our vets in terms of outcomes. But at the end of the day, we also, the statute says, have to make sure that, A, we meet these geographic limitations, these time limitations, and we let the best outcome for the vet determine that question. And, you know, the vets have a say in that. And so um, that's my philosophy. I really want veterans to choose VA as their site of care. I think when they do, the outcomes are great. But they have options. And we should compete in the context of those options. And when we do, I like our odds. Most importantly, I like the odds for better outcomes for our vets. I hope that answers the question, Jennifer. This is a long answer, so sorry about that. So Mr. Secretary, we have uh, some questions uh, online. Okay. Yes, sir. I have a question from Ellen Milheiser from Synopsis. She asks, what is the VA doing to increase the number of acupuncturists they employ given the level of pain among veterans? And a follow-up to that is, does the VA pay for veterans to receive acupuncture in the community? Yeah, there was a significant expansion of our Office of Whole Health at VA. Uh, in the Office of Whole Health, uh, we do uh, have access to um, uh, a range of pain management options that include acupuncture, that include uh, imaging, that include yoga, uh, as just a couple of examples. Um, so we've expanded access to whole health options. We are looking to expand access, to further expand uh, access to whole health options. I believe, but I cannot confirm, so actually let me just take Alan's second question. Do we cover uh, referrals uh, to the community uh, for acupuncture? The answer, according to Kayla Williams, is a vigorous thumbs up, yes we do. Ellen Milheiser from Synopsis has another question. I was about to say, there's no way she, if she were here, she wouldn't have a follow-up, so I'm glad that there's a follow-up. <laughs> Just like I knew that uh, Leo would have his freaking uh, Eagles mask on. This is a different subject, though, sir. Do you have any idea how many religious or health exemptions to getting vaccinated have been approved or are pending? Yeah, so we're, those are still... Uh, so, Ellen, I know, maybe you submitted that earlier, so I hope, I, I'm sure she's still listening. I hope if uh, you heard the answer uh, to the earlier question, um, that it answers your question. We're still developing the data. But remember that, as a general matter, we're not going to uh, get in under or question the legitimacy of a religious exemption, exception. Uh, we will rather, uh, obviously, because we're a healthcare uh, provider, have to make some determinations as to whether um, the either the number or the particular type of uh, employee who's seeking a religious uh, exception creates an undue hardship for us. Um, and if and that's if that's the instance, then uh, we will have to deny that religious exception request. Yes, sir, Miss Nikki Wetling, Wintling from Stars and Stripes. As of the 70% of employees at the Veterans Health Administration who have shared their vaccination status, how many are fully vaccinated? Again, we're developing that data, so I, don't, I just don't have it at my fingertips here. 
Nicole Orisco from the Federal News Network asks, do you have a timeline for hiring the 2,200? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Do you have a timeline for hiring the 2,000 additional claim processors? Yeah, well, we, pro we started this uh, with uh, VBA, I guess, as many as six weeks ago, I think, uh, using uh, available funding we had in FY21. Um, so we are hoping that we can uh, get them hired here in the next uh, several weeks uh, to uh, a couple of months. And then I think the long pole in that tent right now is the training requirement. Uh, given the pandemic, uh, the, the, big ch the reason we wanna get people in the door as quickly as we can is because it is gonna be kind of an increment more complicated to train them. So we're eagerly looking to figure out how we do that. And is there anything the VA is doing differently to hire those employees more quickly, knowing the hiring process could take some time? Yeah, so we, we used FY21 money so that we could, could start the process as quickly as we could, not have to wait for the new money um, or to try to operate under the CR, which we're currently functioning under. under. Um, that, whether there's any specific additional steps we're taking, uh, I can check, but I have to say that a lot of the complications from hiring that we experience in this enterprise, I think, really reside in VHA. I think VBA has really streamlined its hiring uh, process, and, and so I'll, I'll make sure that we follow up if there's anything in addition that we can add to that. But I, I feel comfortable that we're going to get these people in the door quickly. I'm pressing hard on Tom and VBA to get the training infrastructure up so that people can get immediately trained and then we can get them resolving these claims. And our last question from online is also from Nikki Orisco. Could you elaborate on your goal to house all veterans on Veteran Row in LA by November? How will that be done and why wasn't it possible before? Yeah, I can't speak to why it wasn't possible before. Uh, my goal is simple. Uh, we need to know the story of every one of those veterans. Uh, we do know them. Uh, we have a full-time social worker, a, a full-time peer res uh, resource specialist uh, working uh, at Veterans Row. Um, and I think this is a question of rolling up our sleeves and just getting to work and getting it done. Um, that's what I pledged uh, to the vets whom I spoke with on Veterans Row that day. Um, and I think it's what the country expects us to do. Uh, so again, I, I can't comment as to why it didn't happen before, um, but I, I was quite, um, I was quite moved by what I saw when I was out there. And uh, I, I think you all have heard me say in the past that every once in a while you run across these phrases in the English language that um, shouldn't really exist. And, and I think one of those phrases is homeless vet. I think it's outrageous. And as long as I'm here, I'm going to do everything I possibly can to get them into houses. Okay. Yeah, it looks like Jennifer's got another one. Can I just follow up on Los Angeles? Yep. Um, part of the um, settlement agreement over there was that there were meant to be more housing units built Correct. Right on the site. What's yep. going on with that? Yeah, so we just, so uh, there's a settlement agreement around the campus there in West LA. We have both our hospital and associated buildings there with the hospital that are still clinically, that are still in use clinically. Um, and then there's an extended facility, it's a beautiful facility really, that was, grant, that was given to VA by a family whose uh, descendants are still very active and I got to meet uh, several of them when I was in LA. Um, that, that they're still very active in the veterans community in LA. Um, so we just put out, uh, Jennifer, our uh, revised master plan for that. Uh, I think it was in the Federal Register on Wednesday evening. With, uh, sorry, it was we, we posted it on Wednesday evening. It was in Monday's Federal Register, so that is the day before yesterday. Um, you'll see in there kind of what our plan is uh, now. Um, and I, I think there's not significant modifications from the initial master plan that was kind of uh, culminated in 2015-2016 uh, time, time zone. Um, we, uh, 
include in the master plan the timeline by which we'll be adding new housing um, units on uh, that campus. And so I'd be happy to kind of make sure that we send that over to you, but you can get it out of the Federal Register too. Um, some of it uh, takes longer than uh, I would wish because of uh, infrastructure upgrades, because of, uh, you know, paying for this is partly VA money, partly city money, partly state money. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, um, calls on that city and state money uh, for, more, for investments that are greater than uh, the existing um, set-asides can accommodate. Um, so we're working through each of those things. We're going to run this very transparently. Uh, and uh, I think we'll, uh, uh, well, I'll let you make your, your determinations about the master plan. Let me just say one last thing. So uh, if you just take Veterans Row, for example, um, as with that veteran I met on Wednesday afternoon, uh, he did go onto the campus the next day into one of our transitional housing facilities there. It may be that all of the vets on Vets Row, because of what they need and what their individualized uh, requirements are, end up on the campus. And there would be uh, space for them right now. Um, but it also may be that they aspire to something else. For example, I think uh, I, I was told, I didn't talk to this particular vet, but I was told one vet had qualified for a HUD VASH voucher, which is, would actually allow him to get into more permanent rather than transitional housing. So I don't want to leave you with the impression that all the vets will go from vets row onto the campus. They may go somewhere else, but that's the point of having an individualized determination, working with a social worker, with a peer, uh, peer support specialist, or the peer resource specialist, um, and just working this through assiduously, as I said, with our sleeves rolled up and uh, kind of shoulder the grindstone. Okay. Any additional questions? I think we, I think we beat them down. Okay, I really appreciate everybody coming in. Thanks so much, and uh, I wanna thank everybody who called in online. It's really nice of you to, to take time with us, so thanks a lot for coming over, everybody. This concludes the press conference. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>